Good morning, friends. Welcome to On Point at White Memorial Presbyterian Church on this day, July the 9th. We're so glad you're here with us to worship, and we hope and pray that you will find this morning's worship service uh, meaningful and wonderful. Um, it's a touch warm in here, you've probably noticed. Um, we discover things whenever there's a lightning storm on Saturday here at the White Memorial Presbyterian Church. Uh, we live in a beautiful neighborhood um, at the, here at the edge of Hayes Barton, and we're grateful for that. But uh, as Hayes Barton is one of the oldest neighborhoods in the city, that means that the power lines are among the oldest in the city. And so lightning storms will short things out around here. But the air conditioning is working now. We went up into the breaker and we got it going. So it should continue to cool off um, during the course of the morning this morning. Like I said, we're so glad you're here with us. We hope that if you're here with us in person that you might take a moment to um, let us know. Who your let your neighbors know who you are, and if you're with us online, let us know that you're here with us by registering on the online registry. But whether you're here with us in person or you're with us virtually, we're glad you're here. My name is Christopher Edmondson. I'm the pastor and head of staff here at White Memorial Presbyterian. I'll be leading the liturgy and communion today, and Andrew Amade, our executive director, will be offering our sermon a little while later in the service. A couple things to note that are important announcements in the life of our church that are things that are coming up over the next few weeks. The first is, is that registration is undergoing right now, ongoing right now for children's choir, youth choir, and youth band. You can register your child or your grandchild for any of those activities by going online um, and looking for the registration forms. Uh, those are remarkable ministries in the life of our church. If you've ever seen our combined youth and children's choirs it is quite an inspiring, um, quite an inspiring moment. And the youth band itself is led by Eric. Um, he's the staff member that works with that. And the young people that are part of that youth band are not only helping to lead worship here in our church, but they're learning a lot about music with Eric all at the same time. Uh, Meals to Go resumes this week. We took last week off for July the 4th. Meals to Go is simply... Go online, register for your meal, pay for your meal, and then pick it up on Wednesday from the kitchen here in Edinburgh building. Um, it's a wonderful sort of ministry of outreach to the congregation uh, throughout the summer, and we hope and pray that uh, um, if you've never had a meal from White Memorial, it's an easy way to, to participate in it. So Meals to Go resumes this week. Um, Chiapas, the mission trip to Mexico. Uh, they've been wonderful. They've been sending pictures to church staff and to family members like me, my daughter Amelia is there right now. Um, they're actually in the air as we speak, returning home. So please continue to pray for them. Uh, they're due in at 1225 tonight a.m., but the flight last night from Dallas got in at 153. So I need you to pray that it comes in at 1225. Amen? Amen. And then dad needs it at 1225. So let's have that happen. Um, also, please note that we uh, covered your prayers for the Massanetta Springs Middle School Conference trip. We have a group of middle schoolers heading up to Northern Virginia on Thursday this week. And also prayers for new staff members. Linda Nunnally begins as our Director of Community Outreach and Engagement. Um, she began last week actually, but gets really busy this week. And our new pastoral resident, Lee Hunter, um, comes tomorrow. And you should start beginning to see Lee around here. If you're here during the week, you'll certainly see her, but as soon as next Sunday. Um, so with those announcements in mind, let's calm our hearts and minds, let's center ourselves, let's focus from um, getting here to being here, and let us ask the Holy Spirit um, to come into our midst, our call to worship. What shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. We would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very things that I hate. In fact, it is no longer that I do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know nothing good dwells within me, that is, in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do what is good, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of my, in my inmost self. Wretched person that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. At this time, we invite you to rise in body or spirit.
of bringing our whole authentic selves to worship is admitting those things in our life that we know that we left undone or being honest about the things that we know we ought not to have done in the first place. The good news that we have this day is that our God is a merciful one with a heart that is as deep and as wide as we might possibly imagine. So God receives ourselves, even those things we would rather hide from God and from one another. And so we confess our sin with one voice corporately this Sunday and every Sunday because we believe in the mercy of the Lord who lives from everlasting to everlasting. Please join me in our prayer of confession. In all things, God, we give you thanks for all that is good within us is a gift from you. Forgive us, O God, for we reject your love and those you send to lead us. We have rejected your prophets and made ourselves more holy despite our sins. Forgive us. Free us for joyful obedience, that we might delight in your grace and dance in your light. It is in your name, not our own, that makes us holy. It is your fragrance and not our own that pleases others. May we accept your grace so that all who know us would know you. May we be humbled to fully depend upon you, for it is you who sustains us. It is you who grants us security. It is you, O oh God, who removes the burdens of this world that we might find rest in you. Amen. Friends, the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting, from the rising of the sun to the setting of the same. So great is the mercy of God, as far as the east is to the west. Receive the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now as forgiven, reconciled people, we may share in the peace of Christ that passes all understanding. The peace of Christ be with you all. Please express signs of peace and welcome to one another. Thank you. 
seated. We turn now to readings from Scripture this day, one from the Gospel according to Matthew, the second from the Old Testament, the wisdom literature, the Song of Solomon. Um, May God grant to us understanding and the hearing of this word this day. The first from Matthew, chapter 11. We'll read together verses 16 through 19, and then we'll continue with verses 25 through 30. Now listen for the inspired word of God for all of us this day. Jesus said, but to what will I compare this generation? It's like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another. We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We wailed and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating or drinking and they say he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking and they say, look, a glutton, a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. At that time, Jesus then said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to the infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, And no one knows the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Well, friends, I think it is a question that people have wrestled with forever. And we're no different. It also happens that we're coming together on a communion Sunday. Who are we to come before God? What kind of relationship is it that we're to have with God? What is this to look like and what are we to make of it in our lectionary text this morning it is the latter part of the second chapter in the song of Solomon and I'm going to just say it I love this book I adore this book and I don't know that we can come to the latter part of chapter two without understanding what happens before that in the first part of chapter two much less in chapter one and so this morning we're going to look pretty deeply at these first two chapters and understand there's only so deep we really can go, but we're going to go through it really line by line. And what I want to say to you about this book is it's often one we don't talk about um, because it's difficult. It's kind of up there with Revelation. And it actually was one of those books that they almost didn't include it in the canon because Literally, it's too provocative. In the first chapter, this man and woman come to be in relationship with one another and they kind of do this dating thing where they say, I think I like you. And then, you know, the other person says, yeah, I think I like you back. We'll see that. In the second chapter, they start to date more and they go into their courtship to the point that they say, we really can't help ourselves anymore. We need to delve into this more deeply. By the third chapter, they actually get married. By the fourth chapter, we see an entire chapter devoted to the consummation of that marriage. Wait for it. Married folks, chapter five and six, are completely devoted to them deepening in love and fighting. Chapter seven, we'll just say they make up after fighting. And in chapter eight, they deepen in their love and relationship only to be an example to others in the community. It was so provocative, in fact, that the early rabbis debated, should we keep it? And it was one Rabbi Akiva who said, God forbid that we do not include these scriptures for all of eternity is entire, in its entirety is not as worthy as the day on which the Song of Solomon or the Song of Songs was given to Israel. For all the writings, all of what we understand as scripture are holy, but the Song of Songs is the holy of holies. Friends, let us pray. Oh God, as we now delve into your word, we pray that your spirit be with us. May we feel your love in our depths. May we understand how much you truly desire us to be in relationship with you and each other intimately, with vulnerability, with trust and compassion. 
and absolutely in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, for it's in his name that we gather and now we pray. Amen. Friends, if you have it on your app, if you have a Bible with you, I would encourage you to read along. This is the Song of Solomon. I'm starting in the first chapter. We will hear three actors or speakers, essentially in these first two chapters, really throughout the entirety of the book. It is the female or the woman. It is the male, uh, who we also believe is uh, the person of Solomon. And then the others, which is essentially the congregation or the multitude that is gathered around them and actually supporting them in the relationship. And there's one narration. It's in chapter 1, verse 1, the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. And she leads off. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. For your love is better than wine. Your anointing oils are fragrant. Your name is perfume poured out. Therefore, the maidens love you. First verse, essentially, in this book. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. Women, are you supposed to talk like that? And yet here it is, in black and white, in the Bible. She wants him so much, but why? Why? Is it because his shoulders are huge, or his bank account is deep, or he has an IQ through the roof? Is it all of the superficial things that we often associate, or even in our our modernity, is his TikTok followership such that it is worthy of being um, someone you'd want to date? Probably not. Instead, what does she say? Your love, the way you treat me, the way that you pour out for me, is better than wine. Your anointing oils are fragrant. He bathes guys right he's presentable your name is perfume poured out listen to that it is your name your character who you are how you present the way you show up the way you have compassion for others your name is like perfume poured out and that's why the maidens or the women love you that's why so draw me after you let us make haste The king has brought me into his chambers. We will exult and rejoice in you. We will extol your love no more than the other speaking now. Rightly do they love you, speaking of Solomon. When she affirms him like this, the others come in and say, she's right. He really is that great. It's right that we love him. She speaks again, really pay attention to this part. It's the key to the whole day. I am black and beautiful, O daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kedar, which were black, like the curtains of Solomon, which were dark purple. Do not gaze at me because I am dark, because the sun has gazed on me. My mother's sons were angry with me. They made me keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard I have not kept. Let me help you with that one. In this particular time period, and this is not special, this, is, this happens over and over again, especially in agrarian societies, The greatest prize that a person, much less a female, has is their skin. And for her skin to be darkened is to say, I had to work for a living. I was poor. I was put out to pasture. I was not someone who was kept by those who should have been watching after me. My What does she say? My mother's sons, my brothers, they mistreated me. They did not respect me. They made it where I had to do this work, and now I'm bearing the markers of it. You can see it on me. I have not taken care of my body. She's apologizing for her appearance. Anybody in this room ever done that or felt like you had to do that? Right? Let me fast forward into the metaphor that is the Song of Solomon and our relationship with God or Israel's relationship with God. Often when I come to this table, often when I feel like God wants something of me or I just feel like I might need to speak of what's going on within the body of the church, I can sometimes look in the mirror and say, who am I? Who am I to say these things? I'm not worthy of it. Let me... Let me start rolling out the list of all the reasons why I ought not be included or counted among those who who, who God loves. It's not me. That's what she's doing. So she says, tell me whom my soul loves, speaking to him, where you pasture your flock, where you make it lie down at noon. 
For why should I be like who is veiled beside the flocks of your companions? I'm not going to go deep into this, but the shepherds would have, we'll say, some matrons who would accompany them in their work. And she's saying, I wasn't one of those. Yes, I worked. Yes, I toiled. I didn't take care of my body. But I wasn't one of those. I want to be among you, but don't confuse me with something else. She's still standing up for herself even when she's putting herself down. He speaks, verse 8. If you do not know, O fairest among women, follow the tracks of the flock and pasture your kids beside the shepherd's tents. She says... Disregard me because of the way I look, but I want you anyway. Please invite me to be among you, but don't think I'm coming for something else. And he says, the first time that he, being Solomon, speaks, he says, if you do not know, O fairest among women. What does he say about her? You say you're dark. You say you're not worthy. You say you're not lovely. You say you're not worth it. I'm saying you are the fairest among them all. Follow the tracks and find me. I want you to come. For I compare you, my love, to a mare among Pharaoh's chariots. Your cheeks are comely with ornaments, your neck with strings of jewels. Gentlemen, say that to your spouse. See what happens. Call her a mare among Pharaoh's chariots. I'd love to hear how that goes. He's trying to use language that says, you say you're not worth it. I say you are the fairest and most valuable. You are on this pedestal and I will not let you knock yourself down that's how he speaks about her the others come in and they say yep that's right we will make you ornaments of gold studded with silver we're gonna make this happen for you she speaks again and while the king was on his couch my nard gave forth its fragrance she now has some kind of fragrance upon her my beloved is to me a bag of myrrh that lies between my breasts what would often happen is instead of spraying perfume on, like we often do today, women would have, and sometimes men too, they would actually have this kind of totem or this necklace that would hang off of them. And it would have within it some kind of an oil or a fragrance or some kind of a compound that gave off this fragrance to draw someone in, and that was their perfume. What is she saying? I'm not actually wearing that, but you, my beloved, you, Solomon, you are to me what gives me fragrance. You are what draws people to me. You are what makes me feel valuable now. It's not me that has accepted what Christ has done and now on my own, I'm worth it. It is the son of the living God who lives within us that now people know who God is. People know who we are. For my, my beloved, she says, is to me a cluster of henna blossoms in the vineyards of Engedi. He says, ah, you are beautiful, my love. Ah, you are beautiful. Your eyes are doves. She comes back. Oh, you're beautiful, my beloved. This is how we know they're dating and they're kind of infatuated at this point because they're doing this corny little thing where they're saying, oh, no, you're pretty. And she's saying, oh, no, but you're so handsome. And she's coming back and saying, oh, no, but you're, it's gross. But that's what they're doing. And she says, our couch is green, the beams of our house are cedar, our rafters are pine. There's a lot we could say about that, but that's essentially the foundation of our relationship is valuable, it is sturdy, it is firm, it's secure. Chapter 2, verse 1, I am a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valleys. She was previously referring to herself as dark and not lovely. She wasn't valuable. And now she says, I am a rose of Sharon, a lily among the valleys. As a lily among brambles, he says, so is my love among maidens. She comes back as an apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among young men. With great delight I sat in his shadow, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. This is them courting, by the way, not yet married. He brought me to the banqueting house, and his intention toward me was love, sustain me with raisins. 
Refresh me with apples, for I am faint with love. When David brought the Ark of the Covenant back into the presence of the people, he danced before it. He brought out the entire orchestra and the band, and he said, now go home and be fruitful and sustain yourself with raisin crakes. Be fruitful. This is what she's saying. Sustain me with raisins. Refresh me with apples, for I am faint with love. I want this person. I want him horribly. I want him now. Oh, that his left hand were under my head and his right hand embrace me. Do I need to illustrate that for you? I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the, by the gazelles of the wild does. Do not stir up or awaken love until it is ready. They're in great relationship with one another, and they, in a holy way, truly desire one another. Hear that, friends. It's good. And yet they even say, not yet. But not yet. This is where our lectionary picks up. The voice of my beloved, look, he comes, leaping among the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Look, there he stands behind our wall, gazing in at the windows, looking through the lattice. My beloved speaks and says to me, arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. For now the winter is past, the rain is over and gone, the flowers appear on the earth, the time of singing has come, and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. It's springtime. I'm ready for you. The fig tree puts forth its figs and the vines are in blossom they give forth fragrance arise my love my fair one and come away now it is time this is not only the way that she is saying to him it is time this is also the way that God says to us and we in turn are to say to God we want to be in this intimate relationship with one another we do want to come to the table we do want to know what it means to be loved and to love not only so that we can receive that but so that we can give that back out in the world where we are called to go Oh, my dove in the clefts of the rock and the covert of the cliff, let me see your face. Let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. Catch us, the foxes, the little foxes that ruin the vineyards, for our vineyards are in blossom. Our relationship is where it ought to be, but catch for us the little foxes. What's that about? In the book of Nehemiah, when the temple walls are being rebuilt, it's actually one of the warring tribes, one of the occupying tribes there in Israel, who comes back and says, let them rebuild the wall, let them rebuild that place where the holy of holies will one day be. But if they even let a fox come and rest upon it, it will all crumble down. This is to say, if they sin again, they'll go through this again. Our relationship is where it ought to be. We desire one another, and now is time, but not yet. My beloved is mine, and I am his. He pastures his flock among the lilies until the day breathes and the shadows flee. Turn, my beloved, be like a gazelle and the young stag on the cleft of the mountains. Love boldly, in other words. So why go through all this? Sometimes when we come to the table, sometimes when we simply yearn or seek after God, we find ourselves feeling like we're not worthy of it. Or we wonder, how can we even begin to approach this conversation, this relationship? And what ought to be inside of us, what we ought to hear, what we ought to read in Scripture, what we ought to be assured of, is that despite anything we've ever been told, Despite us being set, told this is the only way you're supposed to act if you're going to be Christian. This is the right way. This is what our tradition tells us. And any deviation from that isn't right. What we ought to hear holy and true. What the rabbis saw in the Song of Solomon. God loves us boldly even when we have reason to believe by our social norms or our own opinion that we aren't worth it, it is God who comes and tells us, you are fairest among all. Let me tell you how valuable and wonderful you are. 
I believe, this is me, I believe deeply that when Jesus called his disciples, that when Jesus came and interacted with this world, primarily with the nation of Israel, with the people there in and around Judea and the Galilee and then into Jerusalem, I believe that even when he had some interaction with Gentiles and those who the world, mainly the Jews, had said they're not worthy, I believe being God in the flesh among us, he knew better. And his entire mission his entire life was to convince us and make it a reality that we can come into relationship with Almighty God with respect, with reverence, but without fear. The point is simply this. No matter what you think about yourself, no matter what someone's told you or what you've convinced yourself of, fill in the blank. God loves you deeply and boldly. Have no doubt in that. And then go from this place and love others with that same boldness. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So I'd like to invite our younger disciples to come join me up here for a second, if you would. I think they sit over here every week, right? Is this where they usually do it? Is this the right place? Is this the right place, girls? Okay. Because I want to follow the rules for sure. Good morning. Y'all come have a seat, please. Good morning. Good morning. So did y'all, Mr. Andrew just, just did the sermon. Did y'all hear that, everybody? Did you hear Mr. Andrew talking? Yeah. And did you hear him use the word holy? He used it a bunch. Did y'all hear that? You don't pay attention? Well, I know that about you, actually. But I'm hoping you'll pay attention to me. I do. I do. Um, so did y'all hear Mr. Andrew use the word holy some? Did y'all hear that? He used the word holy a lot. He said things like holy of holies. What does the word holy mean? Does it mean like this, this kind of holy? Like take your hands and make a hole like that. Does it mean that, you think? Does it mean like a sheet of paper that you poke a bunch of holes in with a pencil? Like holy? Who spell, if some of y'all can spell and read. That would be H-O-L-E-Y. Holy, like a bunch of holes. Like a holy piece of wood or a holy, a holy sock. Like if you had a sock with a bunch of holes in it, right? Holy Spirit, who said that? You? I thought that was you. Holy Spirit. That's a little different, Holy Spirit. That is H-O-L-Y. It's missing an E. And that's the kind of holy we're talking about today. In English, it's funny. We have two words that sound the same that mean totally different things. But if we spoke Latin, it would be easier. Does anybody here speak Latin? No? So let's say the word sanctus. Can you say that? Sanctus. Everybody say sanctus. Sanctus. That's an ancient, ancient way of saying holy. And when something is holy, right, it's sacred, it's sanctified, it's sanctus. And that means it's special. That means it's very, very special. There are holy places in the earth, like temples and shrines. Maybe there are some forests that feel holy. Maybe church is a holy place, right? Maybe that table over there with the Lord's Supper, the bread and the cup is something that's holy. Here's what I want you to do, okay? I want you to take some time today and this week, and I want you to look for holy places and holy spaces. I want you to talk to your parents or your grandparents or whoever is taking care of you this week about what they think holy places are. Will you do that? Because a big part of growing up in this world is not only learning what's safe, but it's also learning what's holy and what's sacred and what we ought to respect and treat as special as we can. Does that make sense? Some things are so special that we call them holy. Will you all pray with me? I'll say a line and you repeat it, okay? Dear God, we thank you for holy places and holy spaces and holy words. Help us to be mindful 
of the sacred things among us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for spending a few seconds with me. As our musicians are returning up here to the chancel, just a reminder, um, the ushers will guide you up the center aisle so that you can receive communion here from our elders up in the front, and we ask that you return by the sides. Also, please note that all the elements up here are gluten-free, so everything is entirely gluten-free today, so please make note of that. Um, We will take communion today by intinction, which means you will take a piece of bread, which has already been sort of cut up for you um, from the basket, and then you will dip it here in the cup. Um, If that's not something you're comfortable with, there's also a station where we have these friendship cups where everything has been prepackaged for you. And again, those are gluten-free as well. Um, So let us call ourselves um, into the presence of this this table this day. Um, Let us center our hearts and minds, remembering that this isn't our table. It's not White Memorial's table, but it's the table of Christ our Lord. The Holy Spirit is what makes it so, and in its own way, it becomes one of those holy spaces that we should be, that we should honor, that we should note, and that we should be thankful to be able to participate alongside of. So then, let us center our hearts and minds, um, and let us pray. O oh God, in your gracious love, you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, that we might know you, that we might love you, and that we might serve you. Jesus came, O oh Lord, into this world following the prophets and the priests and other apostles. And in the fullness of time, he came not only to teach us, but to give himself for us a living sacrifice for each and every one of us that we might be in right relationship with you. He instituted this table, O Lord, by blessing this bread and blessing this cup that we might, O Lord, know him even as he has fully known each of us, that he wouldn't be some far off savior, far, far away, but that he would be a present Lord that we might approach here in bread and cup. O Lord God, we give you thanks for the miracle of his life, death, and resurrection. And we have this feast this day in his memory in order that we might remember who he was, who he is, and all that he taught us to do all the days of our living. These things, O Lord, we pray in his high and holy name as we ask that you bless this this cup and this bread with your spirit this day. In Christ's name, amen. We read in the New Testament that on the night he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus Christ took the bread and he broke it before them all. And he said to them, this is my body given for you. As often as you should eat of this, do so in remembrance of me. In the same manner, after supper, he took the cup and he poured it out before them. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant, a new covenant for the forgiveness of sins a new covenant sealed through the shedding of my blood. Whenever you should drink of this, do so in remembrance of me. We join those from time immemorial, friends, those who have walked before us and those who shall follow, when we say that whenever we eat of this bread and we drink of this cup, we proclaim the saving life, death, and resurrection of the Lord until he comes again. These are the gifts of God for all of us, the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Let us join our hearts and minds and pray. 
Oh God, we give you thanks that you have welcomed us at this table once again, that you indeed do, O Lord, seek us out and call us home time and time again. We pray now for the needs of the greater world around us, for places that are too hot, where storms rage that are too strong, where war rages, where bombs drop, where refugees, O Lord, cling, cling to one another and hope that their long fear will end. Where there is hunger, O Lord, where there is depression, where there are families, O Lord, who struggle with communicating to one another, where adult children, O Lord, struggle to make sense of their lives, or where we struggle, O Lord, to take care of aging parents. Help us this day, O God, to remember that indeed there are needs all around us. Even joyful causes, O Lord, even joyful moments like raising young families, O Lord, bring their own share of challenges. And so wherever we are in this place, O Lord, and wherever your children, O Lord, have gathered around in this world, wherever they call out to your name, O God, hear their prayers and hear our prayers, that we, O Lord, might be ambassadors of your grace and harbingers of your peace. Help us, O Lord, to stand up where there is indeed injustice. Help us, O Lord, to say words of peace where there is conflict. And give us strength this day, O God, in each and every way, that we might, O Lord, by your grace, be ambassadors of the very grace that makes us whole and that sets us free. We thank you, O God, for the opportunity to gather and worship this day, to sing your praises, to pray our prayers, to hear your word, and to share in this bread and this cup. And yet, O oh Lord, we must remember by your hand and through your help that to keep this good news only to ourselves, to take the hope and the life of this place and to only let it be within these four walls, O oh Lord, is not indeed what your son has called us to. So help us, O oh Lord, to be disciples on Monday through Saturday as well as Sunday, that each of us, O oh God, would be the people that you have called and created us to be. All these things we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, who taught us together, to, who taught us to pray together when we gathered these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Indeed, friends, we come to this place and we ask to give back. That's not just true at church, but that's true throughout every, every, every moment and every place in this community. Wherever there is need, wherever there is someone who needs a helping hand, our God has called us to be people who are willing to try our best to provide it. And so we give our tithes and our offerings to this church. We support this life and ministry in order that we might not only have worship services, but that we might serve those in the community and the world around us. And so the call this day and every day is to give generously. We will now receive this morning's offering.
I invite all who are able in body or spirit to please rise as we share together our affirmation of faith. An affirmation of faith that is taken this day from what's called the Scots Confession, um, which was written long, long ago by John Knox, um, who is the person that our Knox building here at White Memorial is named after. So let us uh, share these words together. We confess and acknowledge that the law of God is most just, equal, holy, and perfect, commanding those things which, when perfectly done, can give life and bring man to eternal felicity. But our nature is so corrupt, weak, and imperfect that we are never able to perfectly fulfill the works of the law. Even after we are reborn, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth of God is not in us. It is therefore essential for us to lay hold on Christ Jesus in his righteousness and his atonement, since he is the end and consummation of the law. And since it is by him that we are set at liberty, so that the curse of God may not fall upon us, even though we do not fulfill the law in all points. For as God the Father beholds us in the body of his Son, Jesus Christ Jesus, he accepts our imperfect obedience as if it were perfect, and covers our works, which are defiled with many stains, with the righteousness of his Son. I think that's the end. <laughs> I thought there was one more line, Beck. I'm so sorry. Um, thanks be to God for these words. Um, they are old. That's old-fashioned in a lot of ways, but they are still relevant for each of us this day. Amen. peace from this place to love and serve the Lord and to love and serve those around you. Go from this place this day, friends, to look for those holy spaces in the world, to seek out relationships that are guided by the Lord, blessed by the Spirit, and that you, friends, might invite others into the houses of your hearts. Go in the name of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and be blessed this day and always. Amen. And let us remember those fruits of the Spirit, for they are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Let us live by the Spirit. Amen. Amen.